So we have time for questions for all the for either Rachel or any of the other speakers from this segment. I think now for a couple of minutes. <laughs> so I have a comment for Jessica. So I'm just haunted by you have the perfect population to actually do a randomized control trial where you do offer some people less than standard of care because that's what they're already getting. And and the question is, should they be getting that standard within the sort of clinic? I mean, I love your service, but I think you could make a case that giving people less than the standard of care in your clinic is acceptable because they should be receiving that standard in their primary care office or other specialists. So I'm still, I, I don't have really a specific recommendation, but you have the perfect patient population to do a randomized trial. It would help your numbers for a little bit. It would help you target. I would just, I hope someone in here is like, yeah, I'm going to do that with you because it's, set up perfectly and the building the physicians as a whole are very interested in how to make genetics more effective and reaching more patients so they're completely open to any protocol change any different pathway through the building for patients because they realize how few and so right now what they know is that during their short mammography conversation they're bringing up genetics because they know that they just need to get the word to the patient and that they find that even if they spend two minutes in their 10 minutes saying we have a genetic counselor this is what she can do you might want an MRI that it changes what they do so it's just about that bringing the conversation up so they're very open to whatever we can come up with it's just finding the ability and the time and the structure to do it yeah and I think it, Barbie someone has done a video about general cancer related risk does that ring a bell to you and it might be Bettina Miser's group someone has done an intervention looking at a video based cancer interaction so there, there might even be there's something that you could actually just take and I mean you can't use her video because it's going to be Australian speak but um, it, it you know so have a situation where one of the doctors or nurses mentions genetics, have another situation where someone in their wait time, another cohort watches a little video. And I mean, it just seems like it's sort of ideal. Patients who come through our building are already categorized by reason for appointment. So we have mirroring um, waiting rooms. You go through the building this side if you're there just for a yearly visit and this side if you're here for a lump alert or family history. So their process is already 50-50. And then within each of those groups, these are these fancy dashboards that we have, even within those two groups, you're either a stayer or a lever, meaning you stay for three hours and get your results in person, or you leave and everything's mailed to you. So we already have four groups that are already created, if that makes any sense, right? So they're already that way, and there's 450 to 500 a day. Okay. Please. Exactly. That's what we're meeting about literally weekly right now is I was hired and told for a year and a half or two years your life is going to be very chaotic and problematic from trying to figure out how to manage patients. So we went from me answering my own phones to me plus four full-time secretaries who do intakes and all of that. And I have two students from RIT, which is a local college in town. Um, and so they're there helping go over the data and helping us create these computer programs and those kinds of things. So on the docket for this fall is, okay, now we're at least doing our subpar job as well as we can. How do we now do it better and do the research for it? So I think so. You also have a great um, situation to show why they need to pay you a lot of money because <laughs> they ordered a lot of tests and you need to show them the money. They need to show you the money. Well, the other thing is, and this is Eric go la 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 for a minute, is we right now <laughs> can only be myriad. And I know that sounds very silly because other parts of the country have been other laboratories. We have 51% of our patients are insured by Excellus and they are heavy and big and dictate a lot, and they will not approve testing to any other laboratory but Myriad right now. So think about that for a minute. It's just daunting. But in addition to the fact that they need to pay you a lot of money, um, again, just like getting that into the literature, you know, a lot of us will talk in cardiology about all of the downstream revenue that comes in 
imaging for screening for family members from our work, but we don't actually have real data that's published that we can cite. So it's cute. I think some of what's interesting is we're just the information of what do people do once they're diagnosed. You know, are they, what percentage are having a mastectomy? What percentage are hysterectomy? What, how many other family members? So we started to collect, I diagnose one with a BRCA1 mutation. How many new patients does my building obtain? And so far, just in our first 40 patients that I've looked at that were BRCA1 or 2 positive, on average, we gained five new family members from that one person, just from our last, because it's their siblings and their children. And we're getting a lot of men, which there are, our, our building has had to kind of think through the men, right? <laughs> I know. We've, our building has had to think through the men um, that come to our building. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know what's actually very interesting? You'll laugh at this because mammography centers have, again, a little old lady concept. You know, there's lots of 70 and 80 year old women who come through the doors, but it's not being replenished with the 30 and 40 year olds. So our radiologists have just taken on a big um, public service kind of community outreach on one of the radio stations that they're gonna do this fall about um, sort of anecdotally how early detection and how MRI has helped and they're doing these interviews with patients from our building that are going to run on the local radio station which then I'm thinking that's going to be even bigger than Angelina because it's our local celebrity kind of people talking about it so they're very open to growing changing altering the problem is I'm one mind and one person and I'm used to being part of a really big team that's what Nicole and I were talking about in the car and Jane on the way down is my old job was a team and you always had a backup and you always had people there and you couldn't falter per se because you had 10 minds working on it. In this position, I'm the sole person thinking of the things and that's exhausting, right? So just to have, when I said this was beneficial for me, just to, to have the ability to talk about it and to say we're all thinking about the same things. Um, and I know my physicians are so on board with, okay, we have this great electronic medical record system with these four groups already, let's just use it the best we can. How to do that, I need help. So you need to come to our first monthly. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say I have lots of spare bedrooms, so come stay with me for whatever period of time. Any, any day we can run reports of anything. So I can say how many people came for genetic counseling between this date and this date and then subsequently had an MRI because it's all appointment types. And so you can, I could just sit at my computer all day and run those things without trying to do much of anything, <laughs> which sounds really ridiculous. Jessica, I was just wondering, out of your 25% of your patients that you're flagging high risk, aren't there some of those people that have previously had genetic counseling and testing? Okay, I just wanted to make sure we weren't that far. In the Most of them have seen me at Strong in the last 10 years. So <laughs> some of them I go, I recognize that name and we'll pull them out. But it, right now the system is very patient emphasis. They have to call and say they want to come and they have to call and say they want to be opted out. And I am advocating for a little bit more proactivity that there is the ability to figure out who's already had testing and get them out of that generation of those letters. So that's not in their dashboard? Like if they already had a mutation coming in, would it's you It's a see question that? that they have to fill out, but you know how people skip and pick and choose yeah. and don't necessarily answer the questions that are right there. They've just put it into the patient portal so that the patient is gonna fill it out before they arrive to cut down on check-in time and so that they're not writing with good old paper and pen. Um, and so far they've had a very large uptake of this patient portal. And it's only been um, live for a month at this point. So I don't know how it will look you know, long-term. Well, you know earlier when I was saying I wish I'd studied that phase where I first joined my group and there were all these people who'd already had genetic testing but hadn't had counseling. 
don't let this go by. <laughs> We're talking about that. I see a lot of patients where the GYNs in the community order it and then say, oh, you know what, and send them to me. So we have a large percentage of those patients. But what we have is a lot of, again, generations. I'm watching grandma, daughter, granddaughter all be tested in quick succession and then make different decisions. So that's an interesting discussion too, just generationally. Yeah, there's so much.